By the way, uh, I invited my sister up here. She's not here at church with me, but I talked her into coming up from California because I told her summer is so amazing in Seattle. <laughs> it should be fun later on this afternoon to hear about that. But, um, man, we, uh, uh, in my church, we've been doing this series on Ephesians, and I didn't really want to do it. Somebody was like, you've got to do one of Paul's letters soon, and I'm like, okay, fine. So I did this series on Ephesians. It turned out to be a really, really cool book, and it's... Um, it's about tapping into the riches that God has for us, that God actually wants to come alongside our lives and give us power and strength and um, a ton of things to help us do life well. So uh, today we're wrapping up Ephesians. Uh, we're going to look at the Armor of God passage, which is Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, if you want to flip to your Bible. But I want to start just by telling you about a game I would play with my brothers. So I had two older brothers. One was five years older than me. One was seven years older than me. So I was the little runt to the family. And uh, we would always play King of the Mountain. Anybody ever play that? You can play it anywhere. It's a rather amazing game. I think my mom loved it except for the injury potential. Because we would play it until we were just completely worn out. And you could just like climb up on your bed and go, I'm the King of the Mountain. And then everybody would try and come and tackle you and move you off. Uh, be in the pool swimming, and I'd go out on the diving board and be like, I'm the King of the Mountain. And it just started the game up again. And um, it was a blast. Uh, but I've been thinking that life feels a lot like King of the Mountain sometimes. It's kind of like you get up on this mountaintop and you go, man, things are going super good. And then the next thing you know, something's trying to tackle you and, and, and take you off of that mountain. I had a um, board meeting like two weeks ago where we got the leaders of our church together and I was able to report to them that we're like helping 200 people a week with 12-step groups to get over addiction, which I was like, that is what we're here for. This is a beautiful thing we're able to do. And then two days later, I got a phone call from one of the neighbors saying, we will not tolerate these 12-step groups that you've brought into our neighborhood. And we've totally landed in a new church, in a new space. And I'm like, oh, shoot. And now I heard that more neighbors are frustrated. So uh, it just sucked the air right out of it. Like, celebrate and then get knocked down. Uh, and in this passage, Paul talks about how can we stand our ground? How can we actually gain ground as Christians in a world where we take steps forward only to get knocked back? Um, so let me read the passage for us. It's Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, and then we'll get into it. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the, spi the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in its place with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the ways that you want to come alongside us and equip us and give us strength and power to do life well. Um, guide us in these next few moments. Bring things to light that we need to hear. Let your spirit have its way in this room. We love you. Amen. Um, the first thing I want to, want to point out about this passage that I love is that it acknowledges that the struggle is real, that there is a struggle going on. Um, so much in life, I feel like we're... we're told to put forth this image that we have it all together and that we're all doing really well. And I used to think that the Bible was like a story about spiritual super people who did everything right and then God was able to do amazing things through them. And what I've learned more and more as I spend time with Scripture is that uh, the Bible is really, really honest. It's honest about the fact that there are weaknesses and struggles and that we're trying to make our way forward and sometimes we're taking steps back. And the beautiful thing that it tells us is that God still loves us, wants to be with us, and he wants to help us in the middle of it. Um, I don't know what your uh, version of the battle looks like, uh, 
but mine, mine includes some depression and discouragement and, um, and for whatever reason, I can just get knocked into this spot where I'm like, man, God isn't real. I'm barely doing anything. Why am I even doing this? And then God comes alongside me and finds me and picks me up. And that's the picture that it's, that it's telling us. And in that word, it's struggle. It, it's actually the Greek word for wrestling. And I was learning about Greek wrestling this week. It's what pastors get to do for fun, by the way, is learn all about ancient Roman stuff. Uh, and one of the things that they would do is these people would kind of be put together to wrestle. And then um, they would look for opportune moments of leverage. They would be struggling with each other. You get that opportune moment. My brothers have done this more than a few times. And then you pick up the other person and you throw them. And then once you've thrown them, you still haven't won because what you then have to do is you have to make sure they can't move anymore. So they would put like a hand on the throat or a knee on the chest and be like, we're over, right? It's all over. Tap out. Uh, and so it's taking something and putting it to the ground. And Paul says that we're doing this with darkness. We've all got darkness in us. Most of us have some struggles. We've got darkness around us. People are making silly choices and doing things that are destructive. And the world has sickness and disasters and things like that. So isn't this a great picture? You're going to take the darkness that is going on in you and around you in the world, and, and we're going to put it on its back, and then we're going to put our knee on it, and it's not going to be able to move anymore or have influence in our lives. I like that. I want that. That sounds really good to me. As one who's been body slammed enough times, I'd prefer that <laughs> to being body slammed by the darkness that's in me. So, uh, so Paul gives us this picture, um, and God wants to strengthen and equip us so that we are the throwers, not the one who are thrown. Um, there is a lot to us. Uh, I met with somebody this week who was telling me that they've been sick for like three months with sinus infections. Not fun at all. Uh, brutal. And they're like, I can't sleep well. I can't even formulate thoughts because I haven't slept well. And I'm having a hard time connecting with God lately. And I'm like, of course you are. I can't even pray if my brain is feeling like it's on fire, like that's not going to happen. And so um, I try and take care of myself health-wise a little bit. Uh, not too much. Don't, don't say I expect. I'm not crossfitting anytime soon, so don't worry. Um, but we try and take care of our emotional well-being. We try and take care of our minds. Um, and if there's a spiritual well-being I need to be aware of, I want to take care of that too. Um, and Paul gives us some directions on how we can do that. I think that there is... Um, two gutters we can fall into when we think of spiritual warfare. And I've been in communities that have fallen into both. One is that we over-spiritualize everything. Everything that happens in my life is an attack from the devil, and I just need to pray about it more. Have you met people like this or had dialogues with people like And you go, actually, it seems like you're kind of inviting it with the choices you made, but sure, we can pray for that, I guess. Um, but the other one I think is actually more dangerous, and that is that we think we don't actually need God to do life well. Where we go, there is no spiritual side of it, so I'll just be smart and powerful, and I'll use all my skills, and that way I can have a great life. And Paul's saying, actually, what God wants to do is give you armor. He wants to be with you and on you in the battles of your life so that he can do his work. Um, I like to think of it like uh, one of my favorite superheroes. I love comics and superheroes, by the way. Uh, Batman. It'd be so cool to have a suit that when I'm about to face something difficult, like when I have to go talk to this neighbor about how mad she is about our groups, I wish there was a suit that I could just put on, and then I'd be fully equipped for the conversation. Although that might make a weird impression if I have that dialogue in a Batman suit. But Batman has no superpowers except for the fact that he's really, really rich, and he has a really deep voice when he's in his suit. That's it. That's his powers. But he has something that equips him for everything that he faces. I was always, I, I used to watch like the old 70s and 80s Batman, and he had like these things, and like he got attacked by a shark in one episode. And he's like, quick, Robin, grab the bat shark repellent, because of course you have that on you. <laughs> Batman has everything. And God wants to give us everything. Um... God is the ultimate overcomer, by the way. Whatever darkness you might face, think about it. You have Jesus at the cross. The worst that humanity could possibly think to do is God came to visit us and be with us. Uh, we know it's him, and therefore we must kill him. 
So we're going to take him off the board. And Satan's like, that's a good idea. Let's get Jesus off the board completely. So we're going to kill him. And in the process, it's going to save all of humanity. God is going to have his greatest victory at the point that is the darkest in history. God is the ultimate one at taking something that's dark and turning it around. And I've heard so many stories of people who encounter God and the thing that was keeping them down. The greatest struggle becomes the story that they tell that inspires faith, that inspires people and goes, hey, I used to be like this and then God got a hold of me and now he seems to be doing this and that's the proof that God is actually at work in the world. God can take the darkness and make it light. It's, a, it's an incredible thing. In Ephesians 6, uh, verses 10 and 11, I want to read it for us. We're going to put it up on the screen. Reminds us that that is the reality in which we live. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. His mighty power with us. That's, that's our hope. That's what we need. And the beautiful thing about armor is it's not just putting it on that fixes everything. You know, if you're thinking about armor, like, I might put it on and then I'm like, sweet, I won the battle. But... At that point, I'm still just a guy standing there in a very large suit of metal. I really wished I had one, because I would have loved to use that as a sermon illustration right now, just be up here in armor, but I don't have a suit of armor. But, um, but somebody in armor goes into the battle right after that. You know, they engage, and they go, you know what, I'm engaging this, but it can't hurt me because I'm covered in metal right now. And God goes, I want you to get into your life, dive into it, And then you're going to see how I can work. And it's a beautiful picture because sometimes I want to just not deal with it and go, Lord, change that woman who's mad at me right now, and then I won't have to deal with it. So I prayed about it. (laughs) And other times I want to go, fine, I'll just handle her, but I don't need to pray about it. And God's saying, no, I'm going to be your armor, so now you get to engage it, and so I'm going to pray about it, and then I'm going to go talk to her, and we're going to see what we come up with. What does God want us to put on? It's a beautiful picture. Um, armor. We're going to put up a cheesy Christian photo. I want to warn you, it's cheesy. I looked all over for non-cheesy Christian art. You have no clue how hard it is, and I love art. Let's put up some cheesy Christian... Oh, yeah. There we go. I'm sorry. To all the artists in the world, I'm just... I'm a pastor, I'm sorry. All right. But I want to leave that up there because it it gets us at each of the pieces. Um, And we're going to go through each piece. And and I think they're important. The the first five are defensive pieces. They're they're things that we would just put on us. They become a part of our story. They become who we are. And as we walk in these things, things go well. Uh, I also lived in a place where I had woods behind my house at one point. And I could run the trails and I could go explore the woods. It was pretty fun as a kid. Um, I was from Southern California. And I would go explore the trails, and then I eventually decided to go off-trail exploring because I'd seen all the trails. And I learned something about the Northwest. Stinging nettles exist. (laughs) They don't have those in Southern California. Not very fun. Uh, These five armor pieces are things that we can live in, and when we live in them, we don't find ourselves in the nettles very often. Uh, The first one, a belt of truth. Um, There is a devotion to reality and honesty in the Christian story, if we're going to decide to follow Jesus, that we have to embrace. My very first experience of becoming a Christian was recognizing, I screwed up, I can't do this myself, I need God's help. And then asking for God to come into my life and help me. And he did. Um, that's my experience of the Christian life. But those first two pills were pretty hard to swallow. I can't do this on my own and I've screwed up. I didn't want to say either of those things. Um, They did not come easy. And when we live in a place where we do not give falsehood a place in our life, we do really well. King David, um, he's a pretty incredible king. He did some amazing stuff for the Lord, but he does have one dark part in his story. And in it, he was standing on top of his roof, and he looks over, and he sees a beautiful woman bathing, and, and he had a lie that popped into his life. And that lie he gave space to, and it was this. I'm king. I can do whatever I want. And he did. Uh, and then he covered up that lie 
with another lie that cost somebody their life. And then uh, a year of misery comes into his world. And eventually a friend of his, Nathan, pops up and says, David, I need to tell you a story. Here's what's going on and speaks the truth to him. And then he realizes it. And he says, I needed to hear that. This has got to change. I can't have this in my life anymore. And that is the point where he starts to build his life back up. We have to embrace truth, and Satan does not want truth. He loves to deceive just a little bit. In the Garden of Eden, uh, he tells Eve, you know, didn't God say don't touch the apple? Actually, God said don't eat the apple, but he twists it just enough that it's not quite there. Same thing when Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. I think that God wants to give each of us joy. Joy, as I know it, is like this undercurrent of celebrating life uh, that even is there, even in the midst of difficult times. Near as I can tell, there's a lot of offers for happiness out there. And I think the devil would love to keep us happy with just a little more, something to keep us happy. But it's not actually that deep joy. It's like it's similar to it, but it's not quite it. Most of us want significance. We want to know that we matter and that we make a difference and that we're worth something, Right? God wants to give us that. You're made in my image. You matter. I, I would die for you. And what Satan says is, well, you've got to prove it by driving really nice cars and impressing each other a lot. It falls short, and even if you get it, it's not going to make you happy. It's the deception. It's, it's the close enough, but not quite it. It's the counterfeit money. You know how they train people to spot counterfeit money? They don't like teach them all the ways to counterfeit something. What they do is they have them become masters in real money. Be around money, handle real money, look at all the things that are on real money and then see if you can spot them in the fake bills. Um, the more and more we get familiar with the real deal, the less and less we get attracted by the deceptions. We go, you know what, that, that doesn't seem like joy. That seems like something that would just be a temporary happy. I don't know if I want to pour my life into that. But that... Over there, yeah, going and serving those folks, yeah, that sounds like joy, I'm in. I'm down for that. Uh, people who are experts in spotting counterfeit money, it's interesting, one of the first things they notice about counterfeit money is, is it's, it's a feel. It's not even a logical exercise to go, it's this or that. It's not a study, it's a, it's a, it doesn't feel right. It's waxy, uh, it, the thickness isn't there, there's, there's something, uh, and we spot the fake. I think we're tempted all the time to embrace the fake. We were talking in my small group this week about um, Facebook envy. You ever had Facebook envy? Or is Facebook just old people like me? That's all right. I'm good being old now. I'm getting kind of comfortable with that. Facebook envy is where you look at someone's life and you go, man, their life is awesome. They go on these trips. They're having nice dinners. They're surrounded by friends. Why isn't my life like that? I have yet to see a Facebook photo of the fight that happened right while we were trying to decide what we were going to do next on our trip. <laughs> never seen that photo. I've never seen the photo of we stayed up way too late last night and now we have to get going early in the morning on our next adventure and I feel horrible. I have yet to see that Facebook photo. We don't actually put real life out there. We put a version of it. We go, here's my life all together. Look. The belt of truth is a spot where we go, I'm just going to hold on to truth and I'm going to be real and I'm going to be honest and that's all I got for you. And when we live that way, we're not checking over our shoulder for lies, we're not needing to worry about deception and it's a really simple life. You know what I love about belts? They keep my pants up. <laughs> just saying. Have you ever been gardening? Maybe you're not wearing the right pants. You're out there gardening and you're talking to a neighbor and then you realize after you've talked to them and you stand up that they were having to deal with your crack the entire time <laughs> that you were having that conversation. It's so horrible. And living a truthful, sincere, easy, honest life clears up all of that. You don't have to worry anymore about what anybody's going to see because there's just you that's real. It's a gift. All right, second thing, best plate, breastplate of righteousness. Uh, Righteousness. God gives us his righteousness 
in exchange for our sin. He basically goes, I'm going to make you like Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and begins to teach us on how to live a righteous life. Uh, righteous being, I'm going to do what reflects God's character all the time. I'm going to do the right thing. That's where we get that phrase. Uh, we're just going to do the righteous thing. Um, that becomes a pattern in our life. And when it becomes a pattern to just choose the right thing because it's the right thing to do, temptation isn't really constant. You're no longer trying to figure out or justify or figure out why shouldn't I do this or should I do this and was that on the list of the sins that the pastor talked about this last Sunday? No, it wasn't, so I think it's all good. Um, I got to tell you one story. There was a relationship that I got into in Bible school. Probably shouldn't have been in it. Um, and my test for it was, I'm going to go to the sanctuary, I'm going to pray, and if God doesn't stop me from, starting, from getting into this relationship, it was meant to be. <laughs> that is not exactly <laughs> choosing the right thing all the time. Um, when we choose righteousness all the time, when we go, I'm just going to do the right thing no matter what, no matter how tempting it is not to, uh, it becomes a breastplate. And the breastplate was a cool piece of, of equipment because it covered you from like the waist up to the neck and a stray arrow that might come in would, would bounce off of it and that's where all the vital organs are. And I find that when I'm choosing the right thing to do all the time, there is way less chances for random things to happen that just sidetrack me, that knock me on my feet. But I'm, I'm a work in progress. I'm getting there. But I'm learning the power of just the little things. Choose the right thing. Choose the right thing. Okay, I'll do the right thing this time. Um, <clears throat> next, shoes of readiness that come from the gospel of peace. Roman warriors had sandals. And then they would nail little nails through them. They came up with football cleats. They came up with cleats first. I think, that, I think they were the first ones to figure out cleats. It's pretty cool. But it gave them good traction in life. And I think that when we live at peace with God and with peace with other people, as our general rule of how we're going to do life, uh, we find that we're not slipping around so much. We find that we have a solid foot on the ground. Uh, and we learn that because God decided to make peace with us. God decided to show us grace. I don't know how... Many times you have screwed up, but I have screwed up plenty. And yet God keeps putting up with me. I can't figure it out. It's the one part of this whole gospel mess I cannot figure out is why God would keep putting up with me. And yet he does. And he keeps giving me grace and forgiveness. And, um, and then I get this spot where I got a lady who's really angry at me in the neighborhood. And I really don't want to be really nice to her back. I kind of wanted to just tell her, well, call the cops if you feel threatened and... I'll just forget about you. I wanted to retaliate, actually. I was pretty mad. And my wife tells me I'm a very loving, kind person until I'm not. <laughs> and then I'm just angry. Um, and I was really, really angry. Um, and she said, actually, she said, what would Jesus do for this woman? Like, how would he treat her? And I said, he'd probably be loving and compassionate and, and address her fear and... And she said, yeah, so? And I said, well, let him. <laughs> I don't want to do it. But the gospel of peace says that God's given me a lot. He keeps showing me grace. He keeps setting himself at peace with me. And I know from when I'm difficult, when people come at me and go, I want to be at peace with you. I want to be on the right page. When my wife comes to me and goes, Look, let's stop fighting. I'm, I'm here for you. I want to be with you. It's a really beautiful thing. So who am I to receive all of that and not pay it forward? Who am I to not go to this woman and say, you know what, God has been so kind to me. How can I be kind to you? The gospel of peace. We live in an unparalleled time of division, I think, right now. And it is so easy to get mad at each other. And it's so easy to look at the other side and go, man, why are they being such an idiot? and write them off. And God challenges us to know, be people of peace. He wants peace with us and peace with each other. That's what he's shooting for. And so how are we going to live that out? The shield of faith. Their shields were serious, by the way. Not like that stupid little picture. Uh, no, they were like two feet wide, four feet high, solid metal. 
And the idea wasn't that this guy would like move around and juke and try and block the arrows as they came. The idea was you just have a giant wall in front of you and you walk forward fearlessly. And Paul says that this is our faith. This is, this is trusting God. When you trust God, you walk forward and you don't even need to worry about the arrows because you're covered. It's a great peaceful picture. I love it. By the way, the Romans uh, came up with the phalanx, put a bunch of soldiers together, had them walk very disciplined, have them not be afraid and fearful, turning their back or worrying. But if they went forward confidently together in unison and said, this ground needs to be ours, we're going to take it, they had their shields up, there was no way to stop them. Absolutely no way to stop them. Um, when we have our trust in God, as we go through our day, as we go through our weeks, as we go through our month, no matter what we face, we go, I don't need to worry about that. Satan can try and find a weak spot, but I don't have one because I trust God with all of my weak spots too. I struggle with depression. That means that something little can come along or even just my own thoughts, and I can get knocked into a place where I feel like I am in a cave and I can't get out. So, I need my faith, and the way that that works is I have a small group that I meet with on every Tuesday. I have a men's group on Wednesday morning. I think God made me a pastor because I was going to have to be around other people in faith all the time because that is my shield. It's what drags me out. Um, and so I have a schedule of phalanxing. Is that a word? I don't think it is a word. <laughs> Trusting God, relying on him, and being around people who can help you trust and rely on him when you don't is a shield in our life. The helmet of salvation. Um, assurance that God will save. I don't think it means just personal salvation. It's not, I'm going to get a ticket to heaven. What it really talks about, if we talk about salvation, is God's plan for the world is to save and restore. That means that darkness in me will one day get set right and it will be light. The stuff that I struggle with is actually going to get sorted out. The stuff in the world that's wrong, God will set right. And that's actually what he's about in doing, which is why we have 12-step groups at our church. Um, God is in the process of putting things back together. And what that means is that I have hope in all situations. Even if my family is a mess, even if I keep doing the same stupid thing for the 20th time, there is a chance, because at some point it's going to happen, that God is going to actually set this thing right. And I want to be there when he does, because it's really fun to watch. The helmet of salvation reminds us that God is in a process in our lives, in our world, that we get to be a part of where he puts things right. And it will one day happen. And that gives me great hope rather than despair. And there is plenty going on in the world that gives me despair. So that's the, like, that's the pattern stuff. That's the stuff I'm just going to live in all the time. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to be at peace with other people. I'm going to have hope because I know God is up to something, and it's usually pretty darn good. Now he gives us some stuff to actually engage in. Like These are things that we actually do, and as we do so, we take ground. And the first is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Um, I used to get together for a Bible study with a bunch of guys, and we would all pull out our Bibles, and there was always one guy who would show up with like a little pocket Bible. It was like written in like two font. I don't even think it's made to be read. I think it's just made to be carried around. I don't know. <laughs> and, and we would, of course, because we're guys, we would harass him about it and go, what is that? That's not a sword. That's no sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God. What is that thing? And I remember this guy answered me, and he's like, it's my dagger. It's the dagger of the Spirit. And I can't see a pocket Bible without thinking of the dagger of the Spirit now. But the Bible tells us that the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. It cuts between the soul and the marrow. It, it exposes our life. And there's something funny that happens when we begin to pray and ask God to teach us about how to do life and read the Bible. And the weird thing is it starts to read us. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but you've read the same passage before, and now you go back to it again, and then you go, wow, why did that speak to my life right now? It brings up this stuff, and sometimes that stuff is stuff that's got to change. Sometimes it's encouragement when you go, 
man, I didn't have any hope, but now that I've read that, I've had hope. And then there's this weird spiritual part of it that I can't even put my finger on, which is when I do that, I usually go into my day having more faith and trusting God with more stuff than doing stuff on my own. I don't know why that happens, but it does. So apparently, the Spirit of God can be a sword in our life that we use to swing our way forward through the darkness and help us take ground. Um, Last of all, pray. I know Paul didn't assign it a part. He didn't say, this is what prayer is. I think he would have said it's like the screws that connect all the armor together, or the stitching, or I don't know, maybe he wasn't a seamstress. No, wait, he made tents. Anyways, (laughs) moving on. That wasn't even in here, by the way. Uh, I'm so ADD. All right. Uh, (laughs) Prayer is, I think, the summarizing piece of this whole thing. Um, Why is prayer so important? Why does Paul say we need to pray all sorts of prayers and pray and pray? And it's because that's where we actually connect with God. I've been married now for 15-ish years, and uh, the worst times in our marriage are the times where I'm doing my thing and Christina's doing her thing and the two of us aren't even talking about what's going on in our lives. We're just running parallel. And it's after that that we start fighting. The fighting is just the outgrowth of not having connected in a very long time. Uh, We are designed to be walking with God. The picture of armor is uh, somebody is active in their life with God right there on top of them and we can't do that without praying. Um, and so it says, do all sorts of prayers, like a Thanksgiving prayer where you go, God, thanks for giving me a good parking spot. I don't know if God gives parking spots, but I still give him credit for it. But in that moment of doing so, I'm reminded, oh yeah, God gives good things. He's the giver constantly, so I might as well ask him for more stuff. Uh, a prayer of adoration just recognizes that, that God is good. God, you are good and you care about this situation, so be with me in it. Requests of all sorts. Uh, Intercession. When you pray for something, it matters. God actually treats prayer pretty importantly. And right now, I don't know how to fix what's going on at our borders. I I have no clue. There are so many things in our world that I can't touch. I can't even begin to influence. But I can pray for just about anything. There are tons of people who I don't even ask them, do I have permission to pray for that? I I never do that. I'm like, Oh yeah, I just saw my hair cut her and she's having a hard time right now. On the way home, I'm praying for her. Because that's powerful and in the process, God and I are doing something together. We need God's help. We need his strength and we need him to cover us and be our armor. If we're going to stand our ground, move forward, take the things that are tripping us up and put them on their back and then drop our knee on them and go, you don't get to do that anymore. That doesn't happen on our own. Um, it happens when we let God do it with us. The battle is winnable. The darkness that's in us and in the world and around us will be taken care of. And we get to be a part of it, but it'll only happen when we do it with God. So in all things, whether they're great things that are worth celebrating or whether they're bad things or whether they're just angry neighbors, pray, pray. Pray.